we're now moving on to our next keynote speaker who's going to talk to you about what the future holds for ICT for Peace. Please welcome Sanjana Hatatwa, Special Advisor with the ICT for Peace Foundation. Thank you very much and for that mercifully brief introduction. Um, I want to talk to you about where I see and some of the possibilities about using technology for peace building in the years ahead, because I think we've spent uh, two days talking about what the state of play is today. My background is in English literature, and I was an accidental, I am an accidental activist. I uh, helped co-architect a multi-stakeholder, multilingual, multi-geographic uh, negotiations platform in 2002 for the then Sri Lankan government and several other stakeholders towards a ceasefire agreement at the time based on a commercial uh, software program called Groove Network, subsequently bought by Microsoft. And my interest in peace building using technology has been over 12 years using a whole range of technology from mobile phones and SMS to the power of the web. And this is a project that I did last year looking at not the Rwandan genocide, but a terribly traumatic pogrom in Sri Lanka in July 1983, where as a seven-year-old, I had to walk back home looking at people being burnt alive. And so countries that have gone through traumatic incidents like this, I'm interested, plus in other regions, how technology can play a role in the decades ahead of us. The future is never what we imagine it to be. I'm a great fan of science fiction, iconography, and diagrams and photos and pictures from the 1930s and 1940s. In America in particular, this was apparently the future that we were supposed to inhabit. It kind of is like what we would use for transport today, but the monorails don't have a propeller in front of it. And so the future, I believe, is limited by our ability to engage with the present. And the problem there is what Ali Pariza quite uh, uh, eruditely enunciates in this book, but also in a TED talk, which he does. And he calls it filter bubbles. Essentially, that we are captives and hostages of the media and the networks that we are part of. And that any, as a consequence, effort to look at the future is hostage to that which we consider uh, uh, are informed, our informed, our, our networks around us, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's in the media that we read, we are really products of and hostages to that filter bubble that we reside in. And so I just want to leave you with, and play Arjun Provocateur basically, and just leave you with some maybe interesting concepts as we move forward. Not talking about the applications, the tech, the services, the uh, actual programs or platforms as they exist today, but to help us maybe with new ways of seeing. This is a title of a book that I read in uh, for the first time in the late 1990s by John Berger. It's a lit crit book, and it's basically around how we can and should deconstruct the world around us and the ways we should be doing it, and in doing so, how we can see the world anew. One of the things I want to start off by talking about is the idea of inclusion. I think everybody at every panel and at every keynote has talked about it. And I think that's all very good and you know, great. And, you know, and someday in the future, we'll all have a global kumbaya moment where all of us hug each other when we have all been included. Um, I want to endorse this, and I think it's a fantastic thing. I also want to say, what then, when everybody is ostensibly included? Because I wonder whether it will include women and mothers like this. This is from my own country, so I'll use and abuse examples from my own country. This is the mother of a 21-year-old who two or uh, a year ago or two years ago uh, who had a son uh, killed while uh, in prison. Uh, he wasn't just killed, he was tortured and killed. There's a long story behind it. It wasn't actually a story covered by the mainstream media, but this is at her son's funeral. Um, it's a very moving story. We covered this for a citizen journalism site that I run. Uh, and you can see both the defiance and the catastrophic trauma and grief that she has over the death of her, at the time, only son. I wonder whether people like this are people that we talk about when we talk about digital inclusion. It's not her story. It's not 
it's not, I don't want to tell her story. It's not my place to do so. But I'll be thinking of people like this. I'll be thinking of people like this. These are mothers who have lost their children, disappeared, as we call it in Sri Lanka. We don't know where. Most of them are presumed dead. But they still hold hope that they are alive. And every year, they come onto the streets with photos of their husbands, their daughters, their sons, their lovers, their partners, their brothers, their sisters, their fathers, their mothers, in the hope that somebody can tell them where they are. And again, these are stories. These are, this is, these are individuals and communities whose inclusion really in our digital technocratic ideas and platforms are not a given yet. Or people like this. This is a, a, a set of IDPs, internally displaced people, what a clinical term that is. These people have homes. They have title deeds to their homes, but they can't go to their homes because it's been land appropriated by the state. So they are homeless, but they have a home. And I wonder why these stories aren't bubbling up and why these people aren't part of the technologies, the platforms, the conversations, the dialogues, the discourses around peace building as they exist in my country. But also, if you take them as types of the, the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the world in similar circumstances, Survivors of extrajudicial killings, IDPs, and, and basically people on the margins of society, why they aren't part of, of these kinds of discussions, given the, even at MIT, the, the wealth of technology we've been talking about. So I wonder whether 10 or 20 years down the line, when all of these people have been included in the discussions as we see fit, we have to ask ourselves the question, then what? Then what do we do? And whether the question then becomes whether we employ technology to help us exclude people, which is an interesting thought process if you think about it. Because we'll have so many people in our process of inclusion that at its telos, at its end point, it's going to be impossible for us to engage them all. So then the question of peace building and ICT becomes how to exclude them, how to do it democratically, how to do it in a sensitive manner. And should this be the question 20 years down the line, should technology for peace building, be embracing and encouraging this. How do you manage exclusion and how do you manage selection around, say, a peace process? The other thing I want to talk to you about is the algorithmic foundation of our societies and polity today. And we don't exactly see this, but there are algorithms all around us. We are sometimes very willing victims of this algorithmic bias, as I put it. This is a screenshot of a uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, 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 a Firefox or Chrome add-in that allows you to visualize when you go to sites how those sites track you. It's called collusion. And so in a sense what it helps us understand is that what we engage with on the web today is tailored to us individually or as a community. If ever there was something called the objective web out there, it's no longer present. Every single search query that I would put as a Sri Lankan male in Colombo is going to be fundamentally different to that same search query in other geospatial uh, areas at the same time. So what does this mean for our engagement with the world around us? And I wonder whether 20 years down the line we need to teach in our curricula from the secondary, even the primary, to the tertiary and beyond how to engage with this algorithmic selection of the world that is presented to us and our understanding of that presentation has been an accurate presentation of the world around us without critically questioning that which we consume or having access to the tools with which to critically question and interrogate that which is presented to us or having the tools to have control over that which is presented to us. Given that how we see the world is inextricably entwined with how we engage with it, I think that this is a very interesting challenge when you're talking about technology and peace in particular in the years to come, actually, if you squint your eyes, you will see a hidden message in this, in this graphic. And I think that is also the question that we should address in the decades to come. So I'm interested in how there hasn't really been any discussion. I know about it in the panels and uh, working groups that I have been part of over the past one and a half days. Uh, uh, a critical discourse and interrogation about how that which we consume has been vested with power and discrimination. The very web that we consume and how it is presented to us 
has algorithmic discrimination built into it. And I find it interesting that we take this as a given and that it has become the new norm. I'm going to talk about corporations a bit later on, but I'm very curious as to this phenomenon where people take for granted that corporations are benign and exist to basically empower us. And where corporate bias, as I call it, is conflated with corporate benevolence. I think this has an implication insofar as the devices that we have in our hands at the moment, and some of us are typing into or tweeting or updating our Facebook. In a sense, if I were to ask you the question, how many applications and services and websites that you use on a daily basis are you right now logged out of? Many of you would say you haven't done that. And so that then becomes a digital trail of our lives over, in a sense, perpetuity now that is data that corporations can use. And we believe that this can be used for social good and social progress. I don't think that's necessarily the case, and I'll come back to that later on. And I think that we need to, again, question this when we are moving ahead in the decades to come. I'm interested in the Internet of Things. Windows, Microsoft, unprecedented in a, in a spirit of generosity, released for devices with screen sizes of nine inches or less, what they call the Internet, the Windows for the Internet of Things. It's completely free. And what they hope, I suppose, is that for your, the fridge that you buy five or ten years down the line to be running Microsoft Windows Internet of Things, literally. And it's going to be available for free. And I say that when your fridge knows more than your mom, because I think that the Internet of Things is going to have a profound impact around not just the way we live, but the conflicts around the world as we see and engage with them. This is a screenshot of a game that I've been following the development of for over a year. I don't have a PS4, so I haven't played it, but I've watched uh, in-game footage and also the videos around the launch of the game, including from its pre-production days. It's, I think, one of the most intelligent games currently out there. It's not, a, it's not games for peace, but the, the, the storyline is quite a compelling one. The protagonist, who's in that cloak, is in a construction of, I think, a city modeled after Chicago, and his mission is to ascertain data around that which is around him, including individuals, by hacking into, this is a future Chicago, uh, the city operating system, which is in the game called CETOS. And if you actually see some of the game, uh, the game footage is really very cool because he can go around and with his mobile phone, which is our device, he can literally plug into the lights around him, he can control traffic, he can basically look into and survey the people around him. Uh, it's a very, very interesting game because I think it's a harbinger of what is possibly to come in the cities that we live in. And not just the cities, the towns, basically the in, uh, areas that we call home and where we commute to work. A lot of people call this the smart city or the intelligent city. I'm very interested in when the intelligence and the smartness turns into surveillance. Because in the future, 10 or 20 years down the line, whether you like it or not, the moment, in fact, even when you are at home, but certainly the moment you step out of home, you're going to be surveilled. People are going to know, well, corporations, the local city government are going to know possibly what you're wearing, your gait, uh, know by your gait whether you're sick, uh, know where you're going to, how long your commute is going to be, uh, what you're going to use for your commute, uh, and a whole range of sentient data. And I wonder what implications that has for that information in the hands of individuals we might not entirely have control of. And that word control of, I think, is fundamental for me. Who is in control of this tsunami of information in the next 10 or 20 years that is going to engulf us, whether we like it or not? And these are just some of the questions I have. I think that there are going to be, there's going to be new systemic violence on a systemic scale. I think that there's going to be, thing, that there's going to be, a, there's going to be models of violence which we haven't even imagined yet, coming as a consequence of the Internet of Things and this smart city concept around us. For example, it's not hard to imagine if I was wearing Jimmy Choo shoes or a Louis Vuitton suit that I would have greater systemic access to certain parts of the city whereas other people will not. This is the future that we might be inhabiting. We might not even have come to grips with what kind of conflict 
that this will create within the systems that govern the city. We talk about interoperability, but if the fridge that I buy, if it communicates with the supermarket that the fridge I bought it from has a trade agreement with, does not like me switching supermarkets, can a supermarket chain hack my fridge so that my food is perish uh, uh, perishes earlier? These are new types of conflict and system hacks that we haven't possibly quite imagined, but are very, very real. And also the cascading nature of this. If my self-driving car has an accident, and if people don't understand how to respond to the cascading nature of that a, a, a city-wide, we are going to have conflict that we don't really know how to deal with on a human level without machine intervention. And that, to me, is an interesting future that I think we should be somewhat cautious about and critically question. I said I'll come back to corporations, and I think this is something that the foundation, the ICT for Peace Foundation also has been concerned about, but not, uh, in a sense, talking as widely as we should, perhaps. It's around the privatization of information, which harks back to my point about the, uh, the benevolence or the purported benevolence of corporations. There might be a future where the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is privatized where the fundamental rights that we enjoy as living beings, even if you are not citizens of a country, even if you are Roma, for example, who roam various states in Europe, these might be privatized. And I point you to a website that was uh, uh, put up recently by the Greens of the European Union. And here it's a very interesting site. You have here a visual representation of the disconnect between EU policy, which is pro-freedom of expression, it's openly supportive of the freedom of expression and champions the freedom of expression and individuals and institutions and collectives that do it, particularly in repressive and liberal regimes, and this visualization of countries where, which are private entities, corporations, which export software to those same regimes that help them in the censorship. So you have a complete disconnect between private enterprise and industry and governance. And I wonder whether this is going to exacerbate into the future or whether there's going to be a greater harmonization between the pursuit of profit and good governance and European Union edicts, et cetera, and perhaps even foreign policy, where there's going to be greater harmonization. I wonder whether we are going into a future where, at the end of the day, it's not our governments uh, or our local city councils that more uh, know more about us, but it's actually corporations. Facebook, for example, would certainly know now more about me than my mom. I can guarantee you that. And so in the future, 10 or 20 years down the line, when the next Zuckerberg from Stanford tomorrow makes another social media platform that 20 years down the line is going to make Facebook as antiquated as the Model T Ford, what does that mean for us? to have all that information in the hands of a single corporate entity or a group of corporate entities? What does it mean for us to inhabit a world where the rights that we are entitled to as our birthright, as universal rights, are going to be subservient to the ownership that we have in a corporation, whether it's in terms of shares or whether it's in terms of participating in their applications, in their services, and in their sites? where the corporations would give certain perks and benefits to their shareholders first and foremost, and what does that leave the rest of the community with? And could that lead to conflict? I want to also examine in the future how you negotiate exclusion. Today, if you were excluded from a conversation or if you were disenfranchised, you could organize a, a rally you could have a petition campaign on Avaaz. You could have a, a rally against your city council. There are things you could do to, to, to win back your franchise or your democratic rights. And I wonder whether this is the same model that can be employed, and I think not, if we were disenfranchised by private corporations. Who do you go to? Do you write a letter to the CEO? Do you picket outside their uh, offices in Silicon Valley? Can you even get to Silicon Valley if your disenfranchisement and the disempowerment and the marginalization as a consequence of not having access to or using that application 
is the result of somebody who's living thousands of miles away in a different country? How do you even envision something along those lines where you are trying to win back your rights in a corporate world? I also want to talk about innovation because I think that's something that we've talked about quite extensively. And I'm very, very happy to see innovation taking root and happening apace around the world, certainly around peace building far more than it was a couple of years ago. I also want to focus on the need for local solutions that are anchored and rooted in, rea in realities and in the conflicts that they I would like them to be organically rooted in and grow out of. Now, the problem with that is that there is an elephant in the room. I come from a country which still has systemic conflict even post-war, and I can assure you that the tech community and the entrepreneur, tech entrepreneur community is far more interested in, in being the next Zuckerberg than creating applications for peace or for conflict transformation or for human rights protection or for democratic governance. They want to be rich, and fair enough. On the other hand, there is also the tendency, and I think the colonialism discourse, the, the, the discourse on, on colonialism has a word for it, and it's called the white man's burden. It is to suggest, simplistically put, that the repository, the the knowledge of saving someone like me in Sri Lanka resides at MIT. And so we must try our best to teach the natives how to get out of their conflict. I am nobody's slave. I am nobody's experiment. And I think that the investment on innovation has to have local ownership and partnership. And when we are going into the future, I think it's interesting to think about revisioning the wonderful work and the ideas around, for example, the Peace Corps. This is JFK at the first Peace Corps meeting, I think in DC, 1962. So as we are moving forward, I just came up with this. Why don't we have South to South Peace Tech Corps? People who are able to fulfill and pursue the mandate of what Peace Corps was set up, but with an explicit technology bias written into them. Why can't we also use the models that we have today? This is familiar to most of you, or many of you, who might have visited Nairobi. It's a wonderful model. It's called the iHub. And I think it has a space there for organic development. Some of the people behind iHub you would already know. But I think as a, 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 an entity that encourages organic development, this is a possible model as we move towards 10 or 20 years down the line around thinking around how innovation at the grassroots or at the local or at the country or at the regional level can help us move forward with technological solutions. I want to close off a bit by looking at what a future peace process might entail, also because I was involved in the ceasefire negotiations process as a co-architect of the technological solutions that were used in it in Sri Lanka uh, 14 years ago, uh, 12 years ago. Uh, what would it mean to have a peace process 10 or 20 years down the line? Well, one of the things that we might want to consider is what is the future of the Chatham House rule? What is the future of a venue like Stormont Castle in the 1990s, which was able to thrash out with people like Jerry Adams, the Belfast Agreement? This is a large, this is a, a cutout of a large image on the BBC website, taken with a telephoto lens and probably shot on a, on a film camera. Uh, that gave the only insight that we have around negotiations around midnight leading to the Belfast Agreement. This is uh, the United Nations Security Council. Both of them are exclusive spaces. You couldn't really go into them. But what will it mean when we have Google Glasses embedded in our retina, literally in our eyes? What will it mean when we have suits that are intelligent? What will it mean when we have biometric, biologically implanted, or ingestible technologies which are continuously communicating information. Are we going to have peace negotiations in the nude? Are we going to have them in lead canisters? I don't know. But it's a hell of a problem, because you're talking about radical transparency at a level that we even have, uh, we, we haven't yet conceived about. A couple of days ago, Wint Cerf did a very interesting Google Plus Hangout. I don't know how many of you have caught it. But he talked about fridges attacking the Bank of America. He was talking about the dangers of the Internet of Things, where you could use dumb devices in their aggregate around new and unprecedented DDoS attacks against institutions. And I wonder what 
implications this might have, the internet of things going awry or amok in future peace processes? What would it mean, for example, if all the cars stopped in a city or in a country that was under a process of negotiations because somebody didn't want those negotiations to go ahead? Or all your air conditioners stop working, uh, working, or even more distressingly, your heart pacemakers skipped a beat. Conversely, and this is not something that Vince Cerf talked about, is it possible 10 or 20 years down the line to talk about the beginnings of a peace process by getting our fridges to talk to each other, by getting our televisions to talk to each other? For example, if I were a member of one community, could I download onto my fridge the really awful tasting recipes of the other? Could I get a list of the nutritional dietary supplements that they take during the course of a week and then try to emulate it in my diet? I'm not talking about uh, human interaction. I'm literally talking about fridges talking across the divide. I'm talking about televisions talking across the divide to share programming. As Ronnie said earlier, it's the banality of the programming that might create the first bridges. It might be that reality shows are god-awful on the other side in that language as they are with us. So can we talk about the internet of things and a systemic machine level interaction being the first steps of a peace process? Let's talk about live streaming. This is a camera which you can buy today off a website, it doesn't cost too much, and it takes a five megapixel image every 30 seconds, as long as you're wearing it like that and you keep it on a table and it stops taking it. It's a new phenomenon and it's not the only device. What would it mean to have miniature devices like this on our clothes, in our buttons, in our buttonholes, in our pens, possibly even in our eyes, around processes, conflicts, negotiations, and regions like, for example, the Gaza Strip. It's a symbiotic relationship. How will the process of negotiations, life streamed, impact life on the ground? And how will life on the ground and interactions between communities, life streamed, impact the process of negotiations? These life streams are going to be beyond the control of censorship. They are going to be ubiquitous and too numerous in number for you to curtail. So we are talking about a future where if you were to use the energy of television stations, you're going to have an innumerable amount of choice and how that, uh, how that plays out in peace negotiations is going to be very, very interesting. We've talked somewhat about big data, but 10 or 20 years, uh, years down the line, we might just call it data. We, we might not even be calling it big data. It's big data for us because it's big data for us in 2014. But I wonder whether, in so far as the examples I've given, we can, with some granularity, really focus on the areas that we are concerned about in the process of a peace negotiation at the high level or for the negotiators to look at more local level societal neighborhood conflict as the process evolves and uh, 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 goes across over a period of time. Perhaps we can also understand context. This is one thing that I've been really lacking. We understand event-based data today, but maybe in the future we can also understand the context the underlying drivers of violent conflict better with the sentient data, with the user-generated data, and the internet of things being at our disposal as conflict resolution practitioners or as peace negotiators. I wonder what it means for our children around the ideas of justice and reconciliation. For example, I pose the question 10 or 20 years down the line to the digital natives born today who understand and negotiate and perceive the world almost solely through the devices that they have in the palms of their hands and that they operate with the thumbs, perhaps in the future with a wink or the bat of an eyelid or the, uh, their eyes alone. What would it mean in terms of the justice, the jurisprudence we have around reconciliation, uh, transitional justice uh, practices today? Uh, would it mean, for example, that the generations of tomorrow would find it adequate punishment for genocide to have that community be debarred access to the web for 15 years, plunging them back into the Dark Ages? What will the next 20 years hold if all of what I have said comes true to our understanding of reconciliation, of societal, political, intra-community or inter-community reconciliation, but that which we take in a lot of peace-building processes today for granted. I want to end by asking us all the question, 
Who is this all for? She's not here today. Why am I here? She doesn't speak English. <coughs> Why am I here? Why am I telling her story? Why cannot she tell the story of her murdered 21-year-old son using all of the technology that we have in the room today? For one and a half days, we've been talking about the great, the good, and the glory of what we've been doing. But there are still people who cannot tell their story. And so what does it mean for us to be engaged in this field? And I believe fundamentally that today and particularly into the future, our endeavor, our raison d'etre around the use of technology has to be to strengthen dignity of people. And that is what should be driving us into the future, not about profit or the next version or avatar of our application or web service, but it's about the fundamental nature of dignity, which a lot of people in this room take for granted, and I don't, simply because I'm faced with the indignity of discrimination around the world and in my country, even after the end of the war. I also feel that we need to revisit ethics as we move forward in the use of our technologies around peace building. There are things we don't want to talk about around technologies implemented in, in secret in countries and then suddenly left high and dry, which puts at risk the people in those countries who might find those technologies very useful, which puts at risk those very people who don't have your American passport or your Canadian passport or your British passport to get out and have a drink at the local pub when it, things go to hell. I think we need to revisit fundamentally the nature of ethics around tech and peace building, as well as perhaps rewrite ethics around technology and peace building. I want to end with a uh, refashioning of a quote by Robert Browning from one of his most famous poems. Actually, in the original, it goes, um, man's reach should exceed his grasp, or else what's heaven for? And I change that around. And I want to leave this as a thought that all of us should engage with in whatever that we do in this domain in the years to come. That our reach today to do what we can with the tools that we have and the privilege that we have been afforded to come here and talk about and to design the tools that we are doing should always exceed what we think is possible. To always embrace the imagination of what we think we cannot do and should be doing. And with that, I thank you very much and thank the organizers for inviting me. Sundana, thank you very much for this inspiring talk. Um, we do have 15 minutes for some questions. Um, would you like to just open it to the floor? Hi, I'm, I'm Chip House from the Alliance for Peace Building. And you did what I thought this conference was going to do. We did what is important stuff. But in some ways, you're asking us how we take control of these technologies. And I think that question gets asked not just for peace builders. You know, in some ways, Aren't you saying to us that the, uh, one friend of mine puts it, our entire social contract is in trouble? And he just talks about the United States, let alone Sri Lanka. If that's true, then how can we, here's a little question, um, and I don't have the answer, how do we use these technologies? How do we make the choices that look at nth order effects and the like? Do you want to take a few questions? Or? Yeah, a few, yeah. We'll take a few questions. Oh. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, my name is Andrew Benson Green from the Gifted Foundation of Sierra Leone. Um, thank you very much for this wonderful expose, and I believe that you've touched the right spot. Uh, my question is um, in terms of, you know, reconciling, 
you know, technologies and those who move across borders as refugees, how can these people be able to possibly be free from the challenges they face in those communities by using technologies? Those who move across borders as refugees. Um, I, well, there are, there are technologies and uh, mobile apps, for example, that help in that sense today with the reunification of families, for example. But I want to throw that question back to you. It's not just the people who are uh, refugees. It's also IDPs. It's people I would feel are at the margins of society or polity. Uh, they would, uh, I have the greatest, uh, whenever I see somebody homeless in a city like New York or Zurich or London, uh, I always try to help because it, for me, it, it, it's really quite an alienating experience to be homeless in a city like that. You know, it sounds awful, but in Colombo, uh, they won't die of the cold. Uh, somebody will uh, give them a meal at the end of the day. But their, 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 their social contract, their, 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 you know, their destitution uh, for the homeless in cities like this, uh, it, it, it really, it, it really is, quite, is quite sad. So however you want to define those who have been excluded or marginalized, uh, forcibly or as a consequence of the life that they've been born into, I think the, the central project of the years ahead in ICT for Peace, and I've been doing this over 10 years, uh, will be to kind of embrace them. Uh, but then as I said, you know, 20 years down the line, when we have embraced them, it's also about not creating expectations that we then cannot meet around that inclusion and around that embracing. You know, what does it mean for us to have those voices on board a process or on board a project or uh, a program? Uh, so I think, you know, the technologies, I think, will evolve. Some of them are already there. But I think that's, that's going to be a central challenge. With regards to a social contract, I mean, this is a, <laughs> it's a large discussion. I think we do need a new social contract. Uh, I cannot speak uh, as an American or for America. Uh, I do know that I was in a bar in Brooklyn. Uh, during the third presidential debate, which was ostensibly on foreign policy, and there wasn't much of foreign policy around it. And I worried for the voters of this great country voting in, uh, in a sense, what some have called the most undemocratic elections of the world because he or she impacts the life all of us lead around the world and not just for this country. Uh, so I was, in, I was very interested to see the insular nature of that debate. And it, it occurred to me that it's not just in Sri Lanka that we have the problem of a democratic deficit, albeit in a different way, but it's also possibly in, in mature democracies like this where you do need a new social contract, you do need a, a new discussion. Uh, the solutions to have that discussion might be very different. They might in some cases be technologically underpinned. Uh, in other cases, they might not be. Uh, I would imagine that as we move forward, if we take the case of Iceland, for example, and the new constitution making as a uh, a, a blueprint for how things could occur in the future. I would imagine that technology is going to play a role in it. To what degree, uh, to what ends, I don't know. But I think at the end of the day, I want to push that back to you and say, when do we accept victimhood as inevitable? And when do we champion ourselves as agents of change? I would believe that we have the power and should have the power, particularly for the people in this room, to act as agents of change in small ways, if we change one life, if we change one narrative, if we are able to give hope to one person in our lifetime, that is a drop in a larger process that I think can make a difference. And technology is, I think, going to help in that. Yes. Uh, I don't know who's. Go ahead. Just somebody over there. Tanjana, John, I've had the privilege of knowing you for more than a decade. Um, and I have a question regarding um, part of the, the change to the social contract, as well as the understanding of how uh, our devices, our code, is essentially regulating our behavior, not only in terms of laws, but in terms of the algorithms. This is, of course, Larry Lessig and, and Code, uh, a book that I hope, I, if you haven't read, I'd, I'd recommend reading now. Um, the question that I have. If we're going to have a, a situation where we're ruled, in a sense, by the algorithms around us and uh, the context in which we're working as peace builders is, in, is in, par, in part informed by that, 
it's likely that not only the corporations, but the other institutions, the international institutions, the local institutions, even the, the warring factions themselves, will be, uh, have to adapt to the growing interdependence that comes when uh, we have code which now regulates our behavior. Let's take a look at what that might mean for us, and this is my question to you. If that's the case, and we have people that you know, have institutions that have adapted, what does that mean in terms of this growing interdependence and interconnectedness we heard in the keynote this morning, where instead of this type of interdependence being a just one-way power dynamic, but it's a, a two-way feedback loop where we're working and trying to define what that code's going to be for us, does our job become about making the harm or potential harms transparent? And if so, how, like, what does that mean in terms of changing the peace building and the conversation? Do we begin as a advocates to look at the, what does this interconnectedness mean? Is this digital close combat in a sense more, uh, just as harmful as uh, other forms of, 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 uh, of violence? Are we beginning to look at a set where we need tools to make those harms more transparent? And if so, what would those tools look like? It's a very simple answer. Kill off all the Indians who are programming, actually. Kill off all the Indians who come to Microsoft to program. No, I'm just, <laughs> just messing with you. Uh, no, um, I would, you see, one of the things that I do in Sri Lanka is also try to build a literacy around how people engage with the media. Uh, one of the problems is that people actually believe what they consume. And we have a very high literacy rate, which exacerbates the problem of rumor, disinformation, misinformation being consumed as truth. And there is no media literacy capacity. We don't know how to question that which we consume. I would like to project that and suggest to you that one answer could be that for me, the tools with which to deconstruct the world as is presented to us need to be in the hands of the people who use those tools. Uh, you could call it open sourcing. I don't really care what you call that movement. But those tools, the wherewithal to use and access those tools needs to be at a granular level. If it's at the level of the individual or community, that's fine. But I think that it's not there at the moment. Even the most proficient users today of some of the most prevalent media and social media platforms don't realize the some degree and the extent to which that which they consume is a tailored process. And even if they do realize that, then there is actually no great fidelity to which you can tweak the algorithm to say, I want to, for example, as a peace builder or a negotiator, read more of difference or read more of the inconvenient or read more of the marginal or read more of the excluded in translation in my language. I cannot tweak the algorithm. The tweaking tools, the knowledge to do that, and the capacity to access that, I think need to be a fundamental building block as we move forward. Not just for peace building, but I think for citizenship, for what it means for us to be citizens in our countries. I think that there probably needs to be uh, a set, I don't know, a family of, of, of conceptual tools that are able to take all of these proprietary secret algorithms and say, look here, if you want to tweak this in this way, this is how you can do it. So that proprietary control and ownership is resident in another place, but how it is used is at the end user level. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I, I really was glad that you brought up the point about um, about the need to build local capacities, and I had a conversation with somebody last night very much on that point. And then the question that was made back to me was uh, was asked back to me is why is that important? Um, and and what and I guess a follow on to that was uh, for for myself is what are the, what are the implications of not doing that? Yeah. Um, and so I, I guess I just I, I've improved on my answer since last night, but I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. It's not very nice, is it? Not very nice to begin with, but that's just a flippant answer. I mean, I have over 12 years had an innumerable conversations with people who are very good-natured and they want to change the world, 
but they don't understand that it's not just coming in and making solutions, but it's also about leaving behind. It's also about, for me, what peace building is at its core, it's self-effacing. You work yourself out of something. You don't work yourself to be in something for perpetuity. And that needs to translate into the way in which we approach conflict transformation with or without technology, and that needs to inform our design of ICT for peace. This is not ICT for uh, 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 server room management. Uh, uh, you know, uh, It's ICT for peace. And the engagement creates a different dynamic. It is to recognize that capacities, intellectual, human, and financial, that sacrifice to be engaged in that process, that the courage to be engaged in that process is acknowledged in that engagement. And there are people who are willing to do that. If you don't create those networks of participation, what you might actually end up doing is having a wonderful experiment that has great potential and that might even blossom in the short term, leading to completely unintended and disastrous consequences over the longer term, simply because it's not endogenous, it's not organic. It will always be supplanted or implanted. And there are, there are lots of ways we can talk about this, but I am extremely passionate around not just local ownership, but local participation. I'm not saying for a moment that we do not, or anybody in this world, uh, can eschew interconnectedness and say that all of the uh, solutions that are applicable are local and not uh, uh, outside of, the, of, of, of that terrain. Uh, I am saying that you need to actually come from outside, perhaps with a different sort of lens, with a lens that recognizes the value of the people you're working with on the ground. And I, as I keep saying, I'm nobody's slave. This is not neocolonialism through technology. You either entrust and embark upon a process of participation, or you must realize that that is actually the modern day white man's burden. Thank you very much. That's all we have time for. So if we could get just another round of applause. Thank you very much. Then I thank you.